were talking about just a moment ago or not all that long ago is we were looking at how you could have uh, acid-based disturbances and there are various causes to that and we categorized them as either being respiratory in nature or metabolic in nature and what you probably appreciate is that the metabolic conditions, particularly metabolic acidosis, are very diverse, right? There's a variety of causes which can, which, or, or uh, uh, circumstances which could produce that. Um, and so a way to kind of narrow it down as part of like a diagnostic process is to examine what is called the anion gap, okay? So that's what we're going to be talking about today. The anion gap is a useful way of further trying to characterize metabolic acidosis uh, in an attempt to diagnose the, uh, the nature of it, the cause. So it's called anion gap, okay? And so here's the principle behind the anion gap, is it's based on what's called the law of electroneutrality. And I don't know if this has come up yet. I don't know if we've talked about it or if it came up in the neuroscience uh, portion or the transport portion, but the law of electroneutrality just basically says that for every cation that you have in your bulk solution, dissolved in your bulk solution, so in your extracellular fluids or intracellular fluids, there, it must be balanced by the presence of an anion, essentially. So for every cation you have, there must be an anion. You don't have an imbalance of cations versus anions in your body. Your body has no way of really concentrating cations in a bulk solution. Now, that's not true uh, across the lipid bilayer. Uh, where as the membrane acts as a capacitor, you do have a certain number of cations on one side, anions on the other. But in terms of the bulk solution, you have the same amount. So that's, that's basically what the law of electroneutrality states. So based on that, how do we get an anion gap? Well, an anion gap is an artifact from the fact that when you order a blood panel and you look, or electrolyte panel, you get a list of electrolytes and they're uh, you know, their, their, their abundances, the extracellular concentrations of those things, you're not actually getting everyone, right? You're, you're only getting a select handful of them depending upon, uh, you know, what you actually ordered. And so because you're not actually uh, measuring each and every electrolyte, there is an imbalance. There's an apparent imbalance between the two. And specifically, the way that the anion gap is measured is you take the sodium concentration, which we'll just assume to be at some normal range of 140 milliequivalents per liter, okay? And that's, we look at sodium because sodium is far and away the most abundant cation in the extracellular fluid, right? Now there's a little bit of calcium, there's a little bit of magnesium, but it's really, really small compared to our extracellular sodium concentration. Okay, so if we compare that sodium concentration to the concentration of the major anions that are measured, there are really only two that you're going to look at. There's one, the, bit, the most abundant one, is chloride. So chloride has a concentration of somewhere around, we'll just simplify it, 100 milliequivalents per liter. And then the second most abundant anion that is measured is bicarbonate. Okay, so bicarbonate has a typical concentration of somewhere around 24 milliequivalents per liter, okay? So if you add up the total number of measured anions and compare them to the total number of measured cations, you'll notice that they don't balance, right? It, there's a gap, that's the, na that's the nature of the anion gap. Uh, that norm the normal anion gap is somewhere around 16 milliequivalents per liter. Now again, keep in mind, this isn't an actual gap, Right? There are those anions, they're in there. There's a variety of different other anions that contribute to that 16, but we're just not measuring them, okay? So how is this useful? Well, in the case of metabolic acidosis, one thing that's gonna happen is bicarbonate concentrations are gonna go down, okay? No matter the cause, metabolic acidosis is going to produce a decrease in the bicarbonate concentration, okay? And the question is, what's going to fill that gap if you lose a certain amount of bicarbonate anion, right? Because assuming your sodium concentration is still 140 milliequivalents per liter, with no reason to think otherwise, there's two possibilities in terms of what can happen to that anion gap. 
okay? The first possibility is that you lose bicarbonate, but in the process you retain chloride ion and accumulate chloride ion, and chloride is going to take the place of bicarbonate. So what would happen is, just to throw in some, some um, example values here, chloride concentration, say, increases to 110. The bicarbonate concentration has been reduced, again, because that's just going to happen during metabolic acidosis, let's say, so that it all adds up let's say to 14, which preserves an anion gap of 16 milliequivalents per liter. So the anion gap in this first example hasn't changed. The chloride concentration has kind of stepped in in place of what we lost in the bicarbonate, okay? But the chloride concentration is elevated compared to normal. So we would call this condition hyperchloric. The other possibility is that the chloride concentration doesn't change. It stays normal. There's a reduction in the bicarbonate concentration, and so therefore the anion gap grows. It gets larger. So if we assume the same sort of concentrations here, let's say chloride is 100, bicarbonate, again, it's reduced down to 14, and now we have a larger anion gap 26 milliequivalents per liter. This is condition would be classified as normochloric. Okay, so then the next question is, why does that matter? What is one condition, what does the hyperchloric condition tell you relative to the normochloric condition? Well, again, it has to do with what caused the metabolic acidosis to begin with, okay? In a case where your patient is hyperchloric, okay, that metabolic acidosis is likely just due to a loss of bicarbonate concentration or loss of bicarbonate somehow, like it, uh, uh, abnormally increased bicarbonate excretion or perhaps through diarrhea, right? Somehow this patient has lost bicarbonate and the chloride has been retained as a result of that, and so the chloride concentration increases. Conversely, if the patient is normal chloric, what that means is, is the anion gap has grown. That means that there are extra anions that are not bicarbonate and not chloride, right, in the blood, in the extracellular fluid. What are those extra anions? Typically, in the case of metabolic acidosis, they're going to be the conjugate base of some acid, right? Like if you overproduce lactic acid, well, lactate is the conjugate base, it's an anion, it's going to take that place, right? It's going to accumulate, and that's going to fit into or enhance the anion gap. Same thing with ketoacidosis. The keto acids are going to produce a conjugate base, right, that is going to accumulate in the case of ketoacidosis, and that's going to grow the anion gap. All right, so just generally, just looking at, you know, the hyperchloric state versus the normal chloric state, hyperchloric usually indicates that somehow bicarbonate has been lost, you know, inappropriately by your patient versus the normal chloric con uh, condition indicates that something was probably ingested, something acidic was probably ingested or overproduced in the body that is causing the metabolic acidosis. And so that's the reason why this is a very helpful, like, next step in trying to distinguish between the, the multitude of possibilities that can produce metabolic acidosis.